When I was a kid, I remember my mum saying to me stuff like, "Oh, you don't ever want to mess with a Ouija board and stuff like that. And for some reason, it just kind of stuck with me. Like, <laughs> what could possibly be so creepy and evil and dangerous that my mum would say, like, the, my mum would warn me off something with the same conviction that she told me to do stuff like stay away from strangers and not to drink bleach. How could, like, what looked like a silly little board game be so bad, so dangerous, so scary. Of course now that I'm older, <clears throat> a lot older, now my informed skeptic brain knows that there's not actually anything to be scared of, there's nothing supernatural going on. I know this now, but I figured it would be interesting to look back at the history of the Ouija board and to try to understand why are some people so scared of it, what is it, how does the planet chip move, and why do people think they're actually talking to spirits? So for starters, what is a Ouija board? Well, you probably already know this, but basically it is a board printed with all the letters of the alphabet, the numbers 0 to 9, plus the words yes, no, and goodbye. And it comes with a little tool called a planchette. Two or more people sit around the board, each with a finger on the planchette, and they ask questions to the spirits. Supposedly the spirits answer by moving the planchette to spell out their answers. Ouija boards have been used by supposed mediums for a while now, but they really started growing in popularity around the end of the 19th century, when it started being advertised as a toy. By the early 1900s, they were being mass produced. One advert labelled it as Ouija, the wonderful talking board, and described it as a mysterious device that answers questions about the past, present and future with marvellous accuracy. It wasn't just kids buying this though, adults were as well, and unsurprisingly, during the Second World War, sales of the board absolutely peaked as people were trying to buy them to connect with spirits of loved ones who died in the war. It's Kyrie eating a tea. <laughs> Enjoying that, babe? So nice. While makers of the board say that it works by tapping into what they call the collective consciousness of the group, there are some people, like my mum, who believe that Ouija boards genuinely connect with the spirits and therefore using one comes with real dangers. One book I read warns that the dangers people face when using the board are obvious. If the sitters are trying to contact the spirit world, then they're probably dealing with something about which they know nothing. You never know exactly who you're talking with, no matter what they tell you. Implying that you could be talking to any kind of malevolent spirits um, who wish to do you harm, even if they don't tell you that. Apparently, experts warn that if you are easily manipulated and open to suggestion, then you shouldn't ever use a Ouija board because mysterious and evil spirits may try and influence you. There have been apparent reports of things like lights flickering while people use a Ouija board, inanimate objects moving on their own, people being driven to mental breakdowns, relationships breaking up, possession by spirits, and some people being driven to suicide. But there's also some pretty fantastical stories too. According to one book, in 1941, a 23-year-old gas station attendant from New Jersey told the New York Times that he had joined the army because the Ouija board told him to. Now was this really spirits giving him good advice or was this his subconscious trying to give him a not so subtle push in the right direction with his life? I know what I'm leaning towards. Another case in 1913 uh, was a Pearl Curran, who was a housewife who claims that she was possessed by a spirit called Patience Worth while she was using a Ouija board. She then claims that she started practicing automatic writing and claims that the spirit, through her hand, produced over a million words of quality poetry and fiction that ended up being published. But was this really the result of possession or was Pearl just a talented writer in her own right who didn't have the confidence to let it out on her own? So I guess you could argue in these cases Ouija board has helped people, but not through spirits, just from helping them unlock their subconscious and unconscious parts of their brain. So if it's not ghosts and spirits and demon possessions, how does a Ouija board work? Because so many people are convinced that I'm not moving the planchet, it's moving itself. So what's doing that? Why does it work that way? Well, it all comes down to something called the idiomotor effect, which basically refers to unconscious movements made by a person. They're often reflexive muscle reactions, which can be so subtle we don't even notice them happening normally. Other examples of this in action include during table tilting, dowsing, automatic writing, and facilitated communication, which is something we're gonna talk about in a bit more detail at the end of this video. When a group of people are touching a planchette and they ask the board a question, this will trigger subconscious thoughts and memories in one or more of them and cause these involuntary idiomotor movements, which push the planchette towards a certain answer. There have been numerous studies over the years that have set out to study this and prove it or disprove it or this or this or whatever. One of the most basic tests was done by getting a group of people to ask the Ouija board questions while blindfolded and 
they recorded the answers. And they found that when the participants couldn't see the board itself and where the planchette was moving, the answers it came out with were utter nonsense. If it were really controlled by spirits and ghosts, they wouldn't need the eyes of the participants. They'd just be able to move it anyway. It wouldn't matter whether the participants could see the board or not. Another study that's really interesting used eye tracking software to analyse 40 participants' eye movements while they used Ouija boards in pairs. So the first test tracked their eyes as they purposely spelled out words, and then the second test when they were using the board as normal. Not surprisingly, when they were spelling out the words on purpose, each person's eye movements predicted where the planchette was going to move next, which proves they were in control of moving it as they should have been. The really interesting result is when they were using the Ouija board as normal. While each individual's eyes didn't always predict the movement of the planchette, as a pair between them, they did. That means that when the Ouija board was being used as normal, at least one participant knew where the planchette was going at all times. At least one person in that pair was controlling the movement, even if it was subconsciously. Where could we do? Sorry, Karis, you're in a ball next to the mic. <laughs> Sorry. This study also found that the people controlling the planchette based on their eye movements um, often underestimated their contribution and didn't think they were moving it at all. So can a Ouija board ever be useful? Well, surprisingly, yes. If a person using it doesn't actually think they're in control, it turns out that their subconscious takes over a lot more and this can be really useful to help people recall information they might have forgotten. A 2012 study found that using a Ouija board allowed subjects to recall factual information with more accuracy than when they weren't using a board. However, it's not always so good. The idiomotor effect can also explain why some therapies, like facilitated communication, seemed to work and became popular. So in the 1980s and 1990s, some scientists thought they'd developed a technique to communicate with non-verbal people, including some with disabilities and, and certain non-verbal forms of autism. A facilitator would help move a patient's hand over a screen or a keyboard, and the patient would apparently communicate to this screen via small finger movements, which would then be interpreted by the facilitator. It was supposed to be this huge breakthrough and suddenly, you know, families were communicating with their previously non-verbal loved ones. There were books and poetry and all sorts of stuff being written by, you know, people with non-verbal autism and people with disabilities and all kinds of stuff. And in some cases the work was even published and it was like, oh my god, this is genius, this is wonderful, oh my god. Problem was, there were a lot of skeptics and they carried out their own tests and they found that there was no proof that any of this actually worked. It seemed it was all coming from the mind of the translator or the facilitator or whatever you want to call them. What the test showed were that the answers actually came from the idiomotor movements of the facilitator, not the subject, not the patient, not the non-verbal person. The answers were nothing to do with that person. This might seem harmless enough, you know, essentially tricking families into thinking they could communicate with their previously non-verbal loved ones. Like, that seems like it could be a nice, lovely thing, even if it's not true. But it raised a lot of problems. So throughout the mid-90s, facilitators started being told of cases of sexual abuse, which actually led to a bunch of people being arrested and trials and all sorts. One example of this was Betsy Wheaton. So Betsy was 16 and had non-verbal autism. And one facilitator reported that uh, Betsy had told her, through facilitated communication, that her father, and I quote, makes her touch his penis. And then she provided all these like horrific details of sexual abuse, not just from her father, but other family members. And as you can understand, these were really serious allegations. So they had to be investigated and looked into. Part of this investigation involved a um, speech pathologist called Howard Shane and a psychologist called Douglas Howler. They stepped in to test if this information was really coming from Betsy or not. And it was a really simple test that they produced. And basically, Betsy and her facilitator, who was a woman named uh, Janice Boy Boynton, were shown objects and Betsy had to identify them using facilitated communication, right? Simple. The thing was, what Janice, the facilitator, didn't know was that her and Betsy were occasionally being shown different images. In every single instance, the answer provided matched up to what Janice saw and not what Betsy saw, which proves that the information was coming from the facilitator, not the patient. It was the facilitator's uh, idiomotor movements, not the patient's. So as you can probably see from all these examples, reading into the idiomotor effect can be very useful, as long as you don't attribute the messages to any other individuals or any other spirits. It can tell you a lot about yourself in your own head, but that kind of defeats the point, because if you believe you're in control, you're less likely to get your subconscious coming out. So it's a bit, you know, yeah. It's when you start thinking that these are spirits telling you to do stuff or other people communicating with you or all sorts of things, that's when it can become problematic and harmful. 
But that's about where I'm gonna end today's video. I just fancied doing a quite a short, spooky little video for you with some informative little science bits in here. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching today. Just for a bit of fun, I want you to share with me your Ouija board stories down in the comments below. Let me know if you've used a Ouija board, what happened? Tell me, like, did anything creepy or unexplained happen? Or um, have you ever messed with someone using a Ouija board? Tell me those funny stories as well for a giggle. And um, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Thank you for watching today and um, have a good, October.